Brexit approaches first. We will look at the, the likely implications of an EU uh, UK trade deal for the port sector. Uh, and of course, we will then look at what this means for our confidence as participants in the market, continuing to make day-to-day -day decisions that affect our, our businesses. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand it over back to Tom to get us <coughs> Brilliant, thank you very much, Han. Um, our first speaker uh, is Mark Simmons from the British Ports Association. Uh, Mark's going to be talking about the UK-EU trade deal and its implications for the port sector. Mark is the policy manager at the BPA and he's been there three years and before that uh, five years uh, as a senior researcher at the um, House of Commons for an MP. So Mark, over to you to do the, uh, the screen share, etc. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, let me just show my screen. And I'm going to assume everyone can see that. Stop me if you can't. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, Mark Simmons uh, from the British Ports Association. As Tom said, uh, I've got the unenviable task of talking about the EU trade deal, or if such a thing is going to exist. Um, and how it might affect uh, UK ports. Uh, just very quickly, who we are, um, many of us, many of you will know us. Uh, the BPA is the, the Trade Association for uh, UK ports. We have over 100 port members um, who own and operate around 400, over 400 ports, terminals and facilities across uh, the whole of the UK. Um, just quickly, I, I usually include this slide when talking about um, Brexit and the EU, just to highlight um, the volume of traffic that actually moves uh, by a, a ferry, which is that 23% um, little blue bubble down the bottom. Uh, and that is quite significant to us. And that is the primary, um, the primary mode that is going to be most heavily impacted by, uh, by Brexit. Um, and just, I won't um, bombard you with, with too many stats today, this is more just for distribution, but just as a reminder, um, how much of uh, traffic comes, uh, this is, uh, and I should uh, clarify, by the way, today I'm talking primarily about goods, of course, um, as that's uh, what we deal with, not, not services, um, but around half of, uh, uh, over half of the, tra of the um, volumes handled by UK ports is uh, from uh, Europe, from the EU, um, and pushing on towards two thirds of uh, port tonnage overall is actually inbound. So we're an in, in, in port driven economy and that will be, um, become relevant in a moment. Um, so yeah, we've been <laughs> talking about Brexit for four years, like many of you will have been as well. Um, I should say uh, today that um, I, I don't, I probably shouldn't lead with this, but I don't have any special insight as to the likelihood of a, of a deal any more than anyone else in this group, uh, unfortunately, um, or, or perhaps fortunately. But um, one of the things we have been saying for quite a long time now is that uh, given the UK government's desire to leave uh, the customs union and the single market, uh, actually the impact of leaving uh, or, or Brexit or or more, more specifically, uh, the end of the transition period is actually not that different for, for UK ports on, on, on the ground because there are going to be uh, new border processes uh, regardless of whether there is a deal or not. Um, and, and like I said, I've been saying this for, for quite some time now. Uh, background is where we are. Um, one key point is that uh, the UK will be joining the Common Transit Convention, which will help uh, in some respects. Um, we are, despite um, what I just previously said on, on the previous slide, we're still keen that there is uh, a deal, as I'll come up in, in a moment. There are more indirect impacts on ports, such as uh, tariffs and, uh, and the state aid framework. So we, we are keen to see a deal overall, but I would emphasize that uh, even if there is a deal, some of the impacts that I'm gonna talk about in a moment uh, won't necessarily be uh, avoided. Um, so back in October, the government published its uh, reasonable worst case scenario for 
what's going to happen in uh, at the end of the transition period um, in, in the event of a, a, a no deal. Um, government believes that most of the impacts on uh, UK ports uh, at the border is actually going to be from uh, inbound, tra inbound traffic. Uh, sorry, sorry, outbound traffic. Uh, government believes that uh, between 40 and 70 percent of freight heading towards the EU uh, through our RORO ports, our ferry ports, may not be ready for EU customs controls, and those may and uh, that may lead to um, traffic backing up into this side of the channel. <clears throat> um, and I think many of you will have seen the news yesterday that uh, the French began testing. Uh, some immigration controls, uh, just one aspect of the new border controls, <coughs> excuse me, um, and that led to uh, some uh, some delays on, on the UK side. So that is um, a, a fairly ominous sign of, of things to come, perhaps. Uh, so just quickly on what the government is planning to do to um, tackle some of the possible impacts of uh, of that outbound traffic um, affecting ports. Uh, government is planning to upstream the border as, as they put it. Um, so as I said, that they believe outbound traffic not being ready for full EU customs control mm. on the 1st of January uh, is the biggest, uh, the biggest challenge for us. Um, so they've launched an advertising campaign and uh, they, many of you will have seen this business around the uh, Kent access permit or the Kent Passport, as some people call it. Um, and so the government plans to try and stop as many vehicles that will not be ready for EU customs control getting to the board, getting to the UK side of the border as possible. And so this is the uh, smart freight system that is now called the uh, check, uh, check and HGV is ready to cross the border service that has been introduced. A bit more of a mouthful than the smart freight system, but government um, any vehicle, any uh, freight vehicles heading towards um, the port of Dover or the Channel Tunnel will need a Kent access permit. And this is a, uh, uh, an online form that uh, hauliers will need to fill out um, and it will tell them whether, whether or not they are likely to be ready for EU customs controls. Uh, and if they are not, then they will not be granted the permit and they will be fined 300 pounds if they enter, um, enter Kent um, and uh, other ports will be able to use this on, on a voluntary basis as well. So this is intended to stop as many vehicles not being ready to uh, for EU customs control uh, hitting Dover as possible. Just briefly on uh, the, the situation for imports and, uh, and uh, what's going to happen for, for inbound freight. Um, a few months ago, the government announced that uh, full customs controls would, would not be introduced in the UK immediately. We're going to have a, a phased approach to, uh, to import controls. Um, as you can see there, that, that will come, there'll be some basic customs requirements coming in from January, from January 1st. Um, and then in April, there'll be some, uh, some checks on products of animal or origin uh, and other, other goods. And then full customs controls will be coming in from uh, July, which is very welcome. Um, to ease the situation at, uh, at some of our row row ports, the government has also introduced uh, a, new, uh, a new system for, for ports that choose it. It's called the Goods Vehicle Movement System. So uh, ports are now having to choose very quickly between uh, the usual temporary storage model where inbound goods are held uh, at, in the port um, whilst they clear customs, or a new uh, pre-lodgement uh, model, uh, whereby goods heading in, into the UK will have uh, pre-declared or pre-lodged uh, their customs uh, notifications before, uh, they, before they board the ferry, uh, and then they can be cleared as soon as they, um, as soon as they arrive in a UK port. Um, we, this this is, um, it's been welcomed by UK ports. Um, it's, it's, it's entirely a commercial decision as to whether or not uh, each port uses the GVMS or the usual temporary storage model, although GVMS is really designed mainly for, for row row ports, uh, row row ferry ports. 
Uh, just a quick note on port infrastructure um, and how we're preparing. Um, I think some of you will have seen the government announced 200 million pounds for port infrastructure related to new um, new border requirements. Um, this was open for just a, a month in October and is uh, fairly oversubscribed, I understand. So we're, we're just checking with government as to whether what's going to happen to uh, to bids that uh, that went over over the limit. I uh, waited to hear back from that. Um, but this is very welcome. Government will pick up the tab for some of the uh, some of the infrastructure needed at ports, although there's still some questions uh, from ports about what exactly is needed and, and some of the processes uh, that need to be undertaken as well. So there's still lots to do there. Um, More widely, government has announced uh, 700 million for uh, other border infrastructure. This is mainly, um, or around half of it, is for inland clearance depots. Um, so this is goods that can't be uh, checked in, in a port uh, under the GVMS system will be directed to uh, up to 10 inland uh, sites, uh, such as the one in Ashford. Uh, is the location of some of those uh, sites there. The red ones are the ones that um, hopefully be up and running um, very soon. Just a quick note on some of the other things government has, has done to get us prepared. Uh, another 235 million for uh, staffing and IT systems uh, to make sure that there are enough uh, customs officers and that, uh, uh, that our systems are ready to handle all the new declarations. Um, and also funding to train up uh, intermediaries um, uh, for agents and so on. Many of you have seen uh, the, the first time we uh, we went through the uh, Brexit deadline, the government had uh, just to, in, in anticipation of disruption on the short straits at Dover, uh, the government has introduced a freight capacity scheme to ensure that um, they can uh, purchase up to 3,000 uh, spaces on, on ferries on less on routes that are likely to be less congested uh, from the 1st of uh, January, although I'm still not clear exactly how that's going to work and how uh, businesses might make use of that, but I uh, hope to hear some more on that uh, soon. But those uh, back freight capacity will be reserved on, uh, on eight, uh, nine routes serving eight ports uh, listed there. Just a quick note on uh, the Northern Ireland uh, protocol. Um, so the UK government has agreed that uh, any goods moving uh, between Northern Ireland and Great Britain should take place uh, as it does now. Anything moving from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, however, uh, will, there will be some checks required. Um, and trade between Northern Ireland and the EU should continue unaffected. Uh, and Northern Ireland will still benefit from any UK F, um, free trade agreements that we have signed or rolled over. Uh, the government has also set up the Trader Support Service for anyone uh, trading in or out of Northern Ireland uh, to use to help them help them with any customs processes. That's intended to ease any uh, frictions um, coming in and out of Northern Ireland. Um, and just. So most of what I've been talking about, we're preparing, as I've said, for uh, no deal. Um, although, as I've said, to be honest, a deal looks quite likely in terms of border processes. One area that we are keen, one reason we're keen to see a deal is uh, around tariffs. Um, obviously, we want to see that um, kept to a minimum, uh, likely to be tariffs on things like cars and fish, uh, which affect some, some ports in, in quite a major way. Um, However, if in the event of no deal, the, cust the UK global tariff has been uh, published and there's some details uh, there. Um, I'm going to leave it there, Tom. Uh, happy to take some questions on that, uh, on, on, any, uh, on any of the impacts we're expecting from, uh, from, a, from a deal or no deal. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, in terms of questions, uh, now's the time, people. Um, I'll start with one with Han. If, uh, Han, if you wanted to unmute, it um, would be a good time. Thank you. Mark, hi. Yeah, I was just wondering whether the ports, especially the rural ones, they've done any 
any study or, uh, or simulations in terms of what percentage of them will actually have that additional temporary storage capability once this thing hits us at the beginning of the year. Is there any indication on that in terms of the capability to cope with it? Um, so most, the, most row reports, um, and perhaps I should have um, explained it. So most row reports won't have the space to do temporary storage. Um, yeah. So that's why the GVMS was really designed with, with uh, those row reports in mind. Um, so I, I don't think any studies have been done. I think there's an assumption that uh, most of them, there's around 35 uh, terminals that handle ferries in, in the UK. Um, and most of those will be uh, intra-EU um, traffic. In fact, well, and the ones that aren't are, are domestic. Um, so no, most of, I don't think any, any formal study has been done, but uh, the vast majority of them won't have adequate space to do, to do the checks. Okay, so the government sites are going to be absolutely fundamental in terms of, um, uh, if you like, controlling the flow to and from the port. Absolutely, yes. Thank you. That was me just testing my microphone. Uh, more questions from the floor, anyone? Uh, please do unmute and ask a question. In the meantime, I'll, 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 while anyone gets ready, um, I would just mark, I would, how do the other ports, you know, welcoming this? Is it, does it mean they've got more infrastructure? Is it more business for them somehow? How are they generally uh, seeing this? The GVMS system, do you mean? Or the, or uh, the, the, the whole sort of trade deal and the sort of focus, the uh, car park and... Um, it's, it's very, it's, it's different. So the, the as I sort of mentioned at the beginning, that the ports industry is very diverse, as, as everyone here will know. Um, most of the ferry ports, obviously, that will not be <laughs> be welcoming any disruption. Although the GVMS system, I think, will, will help to some extent with that. Um, what I would say is that there is uh, there, there's a large number of ports in in the UK. Some of them, some of them will see, frankly, an opportunity in Brexit. Um, some of them will 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 uh, and not to put too fine a point on it, some of them will, will see an op opportunity in disruption at some of those, uh, some of those key routes, um, as, as uh, trade may need to go, may, may need to find other routes. So um, th there is plenty of port capacity. Um, some of it may need, to, may need to go by other modes or by other routes. So different ports yeah. have, have, have reacted in different ways. We, we also represent a large number of fishing ports, for example, who, who uh, many of them are, uh, you know, been delighted uh, by the opportunity to get out of the common fisheries policy. Uh, others, have, uh, even, but, it, but then again, some of those fishing ports um, deal in, in a lot of uh, fish that is then exported straight to the EU and are realising that um, uh, some of that stuff is likely to, to meet, um, meet with delays at, at, on the EU side. And as uh, someone said to me the other day, it's nothing, nothing in such a hurry as a, as a dead fish. So, um, so some of that stuff being exported will, um, you know, will, will lose its value very quickly. So yeah. to be honest, the, 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 the attitude to Brexit and the attitude to some of the decisions that have been made in relation to Brexit are probably as diverse as, as the industry itself. Well, okay. Look, any more, any further questions for Mark? Um, hello. Hello. Can you is, hear me? is this uh, who's Nelson? Who's, no, Bryn. Hi. Do, please do ask a question. Okay, uh, I'm Nelson Kay uh, from the Cleaner Ocean Foundation, and essentially we're developing solar powered vessels, um, and we have identified uh, that for ports with solar vessels, you would need a much quicker turnaround time because the vessels will be about one fifth the size of the uh, 400 uh, thousand ton tankers that you've got at the moment due to physical limitations. I was just wondering, um, obviously this is years ahead, that if you had, did have uh, a mix of solar store of hydrogen powered uh, vessels, that would the British ports be able to deal with the faster turnaround? Um, again, depends on the port, I imagine. Uh, but yes, I'm sure there'll be plenty of ports that'll be able to handle uh, a faster turnaround. Some of them obviously do, you know, turn around in half an hour, 45 minutes already. So 
uh, it depends how, how fast you're, you're talking about, but um, I'm sure um, you know, the ferry sector is, is very varied. Some of them, uh, uh, yes, in short, it depends on the route, but I'm sure there'll be some that will be able to handle a, a quicker turnaround. Did you have, are there any particular areas in, or routes in mind that you're looking at? Uh, no, what, what I was thinking is that you just said 45 minutes for a turnaround. Um, does that mean, does that include uh, the docking time and, and the unloading time, or is that just the unloading time? Um, I'm not sure, actually. I'd have to come back to you on that. I, I believe it's uh, in total, but um, I, I'm not sure. Uh, but but that, that, that's at the shorter end. Uh, you know, other ports, there'll, there'll be longer... Uh, longer turnaround times, and it depends on how quickly, you know, how many how many sailings they have. I'm, I, th those shorter ones are obviously on, on the short straits where they're, they're yeah. more or less constantly moving. Um, yeah. Other routes tend, you know, it's it's not quite it's not quite the same. Not quite the same. Uh, we we were thinking that there would have to be a a, a much higher degree of automation of, to enable these it to work as a system. Uh, granted that we're many years away from a situation like that. Um, anyway, I just thought I'd, I'd pose the question for you. <laughs> oh, yes, it, it, it sounds really interesting. I'd, I'd love to hear about a bit more about it, perhaps uh, outside of this meeting. If, uh, if okay. To that. Right. All right. Thanks. Oh, Thanks very much. We have uh, one final question. Um, Keir, I, don't, you, I see you've uh, turned your camera on. Do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Keir Gravel here from... Nash, um, obviously recently we've heard a lot about the government wanting to rebalance uh, the country and um, so that the north-south divide is less prominent. Um, it's been confirmed that's going ahead still and that's the idea. Would that also include ports and harbours, do you think? Um, largely because it seems um, that there is a lot of pressure on the cross-channel routes, um, especially on the county of Kent. Um, and do you think that the government would be looking at rebalancing in the same way as they are the rest of the economy as well? Um, I, I know. I, I'm, yes, in, in short, yes. I think the government uh, recognises that ports can be a key uh, driver for rebalancing. That's part. Of, that's really what's pushing forward the free ports program, um, which I didn't really cover in here because it wasn't that related. But I'm happy to talk about. Um, so yes, whether that. Um, I think the government is also looking at resilience and trade resilience and uh, and how that plays in and. The, the, the Humber ports themselves, for example, are, are making a, a play about how they um, how they're, they are ready to handle extra extra volumes after Brexit, should there be any disruption and so on. So I'm sure the government has heard that. Uh, traditionally, we've not really welcomed, uh, to, to put it lightly, government intervention or interest in this. The, the, the sector, the port sector, has always been very market led. We, we don't really, we wouldn't really want government saying freight should go this way instead of that way. Um, and I think that will probably remain our position for the foreseeable, foreseeable future. But in, in terms of um, ports being drivers for prosperity and investment uh, and growth, uh, yes, absolutely, government recognises that. And um, I think that's what we'll see when, when they start to announce some of these free ports um, next year in that levelling up, as they put it, and innovation in particular are, uh, are key aspects of any uh, bids that the government expects to see as part of that program. Although I should say it's not necessarily north versus south, although um, it is skewed more towards the, the north of England. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, levelling up. That's the term I was trying to think of. Um, yeah. I say I, I live in Bristol, so um, so yeah, I understand that it's not just north south divide as well. Mark, uh, thank you ever so much indeed for your your input today. Um, some good, good questions there as well. So. Thanks very much. I think you, if you could uh, unshare your screen, that would be a help. And go. perhaps we can uh, we can queue up Trevor at this point. Uh, Trevor Indeed. Drogues from Clarkson's. Uh, Trevor's going to talk about the shipping markets and COVID nineteen, the impacts so so far, and planning ahead. Uh, we're very lucky to have uh, Trevor. He's the director of uh, director at Clarkson's Research. And uh, reading his bio online, he's, he's, he's been there 23 years. I, I believe you get less for murder, Trevor. <laughs> so, um, over to you, Trevor. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much, Tom. And uh, good morning, everybody. And, and hopefully everybody can see my screen. Okay, so please, please let me know if you can't. Um, essentially, um, you know, I, I think uh, the uh, review of the last year is, uh, you know, by nature going to revolve a lot about uh, looking at uh, the impacts of COVID-19. Uh, but I think in our presentation today, we're also going to take a little bit of an outlook beyond that as well. And I think in particular, I, I would say, from uh, my point of view, a lot of our clients at Clarkson's Research are you know, now coming to talk to us about uh, their post-COVID planning. I think um, just briefly an introduction to Clarkson's Research. For those who haven't met me before or for those who haven't been introduced to Clarkson's Research, we are the uh, data and intelligence arm of the Clarkson's Group. The Clarkson's Group being the, the leading provider of a range of uh, commercial shipping services around the industry and around the world. Um, most historically and perhaps most famously, the shipbroking part of the group. But in Clarkson's Research, we've got over 130 employees, which I think makes us you know, one of one of the leading, if not the leading, provider of data and intelligence in, in shipping and trade and and offshore and energy. Um, but essentially, I want to talk split this into three parts. I think first of all, I would like to look at the impact of COVID nineteen on seaborne trade and seaborne activity generally uh, on, on a global basis. I think also then we should look at, uh, as we typically would do in any review, look at the impact of this on the shipping markets. And then uh, the third part is to turn our attention perhaps to some of the issues related to post-COVID planning. And the one I want to spend the time on today really is, is what I call the green transition or the, the environmental and regulatory aspects of um, you know of the of uh, the post covid period for the for the shipping industry but first of all let's look at the impact of the seaborne impact of covid-19 i mean these three graphs help you sort of get into the subject first of all you know global gdp uh, the sort of forecast for global GDP for 2020 are now settling down at, you know, but around minus four and a half percent. And that, that to put that in context, that's that's a little bit worse than the four quarters that immediately came after the global financial crisis. So if you take the four quarters after Lehman Brothers, you'll get to minus two and a half, minus three percent. So this is a, a slightly bigger shock for the world economy. If we move to the right, we can see its impact on industrial production. Shipping is all about the physical economy. Uh, the effect of COVID-19 on the world economy has had a heavy focus on uh, on services, of course. Uh, and in terms of industrial production, you can see it was a very sharp shock, uh, but it actually has bounced back relatively quickly. So uh, the Pacific leading the Atlantic there, but the size of that shock was actually that's actually a bigger shock than we had after the financial crisis, after Lehman Brothers, but the return to form of industrial production in general has been quicker. So it's sort of shorter but sharper. And how that translates to seaborne trade, you can see in the last graph. And this is where you perhaps can start to distill your thoughts on the seaborne impact. Again, a very sharp impact. We, we have a global trade basket which we track monthly. It's not perfect. You can't track every single last ton of the 12 billion tons of seaborne trade uh, monthly. But the sort of 85 to 90 percent that we can track monthly in April and May, you were double digit down year on year. I think it was the worst month. I think was was May at minus 12 percent year on year. But actually now that's that's almost back to year on year neutral, you know, 0 percent year on year by the time that gets back to September, which are the latest kind of official readings we have. The three month moving average is somewhere around sort of minus three percent. So the impact has eased back. There have been improvements. The impact on seaborne trade in the second half has been less pronounced than the impact on seaborne trade in in the second quarter, for instance, or even in the first quarter with the, you know, the initial impact of the outbreak in China. And, and actually ongoing indicators that we have on things like port calls uh, and other activity indicators which we're tracking, I'll show you more in a moment or two, do support the fact that uh, although there's building risks from the second waves, uh, the second wave perhaps in the European economies and elsewhere, uh, that we are seeing ongoing improvements. Um, so where does that leave us? We think global seaborne trade is going to shrink by about 3% this year. Uh, but I, I have to say, we, we've our forecast, first of all, started to get worse and worse, like most people's, as you can see in the graph. By the time it got to the middle of April, we thought it would be more like minus 5% impact on seaborne trade this year. Um, as things improved, perhaps ahead of expectations, 
uh, we've settled at around kind of minus three percent. So that that kind of gives you the context, and that's that's um, uh, not too dissimilar from what we saw in 2009 after the global financial crisis. And I, and I would say to me that's kind of like worst case scenario avoided. It, obviously, we'd rather not have shrinking seaborne trade, but I think the worst case scenario of maybe minus five or minus six percent has has actually probably been avoided. Um, our, we're currently uh, cautiously positive about you know a bounce back next year being the most reasonable scenario given recent trade trends and we're currently at about five percent growth for next year but what i would point out is a lot of short-term variation as you saw from the graph on the previous slide and also a lot of variation across commodities so the crude oil oil products oil demands well down they're going to shrink by more like six or seven percent this year containers perhaps we expected was going to be one of the worst going into the crisis but actually uh, for a number of reasons whether that's to do with uh, changing consuming habits from home uh, or whether it's restocking now in certain areas it hasn't been quite so badly affected and something like the gas lng actually will still grow so there is very great variation across the sectors and I would also point out there is variation across regions. I mean, I think broadly, we expect, as the graph on the left hand side shows us to sort of the shock to be similar to the financial crisis. That's our sort of 12 billion tons of seaborne trade. And you can see the, the dip in 2009 and the dip last year of uh, roughly the, or the, the dip this year are roughly of the same magnitude. But regional variations are important here, too. And if you look you know, the graph on the right hand side, the graphs on the right hand side, uh, we have been spending a lot of time on sort of day to day tracking. And you can see that um, at the bottom, Chinese deep sea cargo ship calls sort of uh, had a shock early in the year, but then sort of got back on to sort of uh, back onto last year's trend relatively quickly. Uh, and right now for November so far at about 5% up. So it's a nice thing to be able to track daily activity really really gets you much nearer term than official trade statistics but on a global basis you know april may june even up to early july we were way still way way below trend in terms of global shipping activity and it's just getting back onto terms with the 2019 trend by the time you get through to october and now so there's been a there's a sort of regional complexity here as well but um I mean, I think that gives, hopefully gives you an idea of the size of the impact on shipping, perhaps worst case avoided, but still definitely a negative impact on trade. I think it was also looking worth looking at this disruption compared to other sectors. And, you know, I've alluded to the fact that some service industries, as we all know, have been much harder hit by COVID. But looking across transportation as well, I, I would say shipping, again, worst case avoided could be worse. Our deep sea cargo port calls, the peak negative impact at the top of the net graph on the left hand side was was around negative 10%. You know, the worst impact on air cargo globally from the statistics we have access to is more like minus 30. Uh, you look at passenger cars in the UK and the peak negative impact was minus 66. You look at passenger rail in the UK and it was 95% down in April. And uh, so I think, you know, when you look at the graph on the right hand side, the shape of recovery has varied, uh, but actually shipping as an industry probably is in the top quartile there of sort of transportation industries in terms of uh, both the se severity of the impact of COVID, but also the, the sort of the robustness or speed of uh, getting back onto terms and the sort of uh, rebound, if you like. So I, th I think the general message there is definitely a negative impact on shipping. It is, we are seeing improvements in a lot of sectors in the second half and actually worst case scenario perhaps ha has actually been avoided. Um, but of course it's had impact on the markets. So our Clark C index, which I think we present to this forum every year, uh, which is our sort of volume shipping market index carry, ca covering tankers, bulkers, container ships, gas, um, you know, has been increasing uh, for for the for last three or four years. So sort of 16 was, was one of the worst years for a long while. 17 was better than 16, 18 better than 17, 2019 better than uh, 2018. But guess what? Actually, in the teeth of the COVID crisis, the first half this year, uh, was the strongest first half for a decade. It was up 39% year on year and was uh, definitely in excess of uh, last year's performance with an average Clarksy index of over $16,000 a day. And you can see that in the middle graph uh, where you can see how sort of strong earnings actually got. But what was driving that? That was really driven by 
one particular sector, the tanker market, which had a huge spike. And we'll look at this in detail in a moment. We had a huge spike, record earnings levels for crew tankers and product tankers on the back of a lot of capacity going in to be used for floating storage of oil. Remember back to the spring when the oil price, some oil price indicators even went negative and the oil price was in strong contango, uh, causing people to want to store oil. And once they filled up all the landside storage, they moved to the uh, use of tankers for steering oil and oil products, which absorbs huge, huge, it absorbs um, easily 15% of the global tanker supply uh, in some sectors. And uh, that led to um, obviously much, much stronger markets. That then eased back. The, t- the storage starts to unwind as you get to the summer and the Clarkson index fell. And right now we're at about $13,000 a day. But if you if you look at $13,000 a day for the Clarkson index, it, perhaps again, it's a signal that markets are okay. The volume shipping markets have avoided the worst case scenario. That's still better than the 2018 average, the 2017 average. Um, you know, it, that's okay market conditions as far as the Clarkson index is concerned. But outside the volume shipping sectors, we've seen more stress. So the cruise business, the ferry business, the offshore oil and gas business have all been under huge stress, as I'm sure you've, you know, you, you've observed and picked up on, you know, some of the the non sort of volume cargo shipping markets have been under a lot more distress uh, for various reasons related to COVID, uh, particularly related to movement restrictions, uh, but also related to the energy market conditions uh, compared to those volume shipping markets of tankers, bulkers, containers, gas. And there's lots of complexity. I mean, I've spoken about tanker storage. It got up to 11% of the overall tanker fleet in the late spring. Uh, container ships, at one point we had 11% of the fleet idle. And now we've only got about 4% not active. Huge sort of swings and following the complexities across Texas has been very important. Port congestion for the Cape sizes, so the bulk carriers, there's been bouts of severe port congestion. Scrubber retrofitting to meet the IMO 2020 global sulfur cap regulations has also been important. At one point we had, early in the year, we had about 2% of the fleet out of action undergoing a scrubber retrofit at a repair yard as the differential between low sulfur and high sulfur fuel prices has narrowed. That's a much smaller number now, and we're working through the scrubber program, of course, uh, but that's caused disruption too. Big swings in idle car carriers, for instance, that's that's an area that saw a lot of stress earlier in the year, and speeds have changed a lot. Our speed index is, you know, it's actually on average this year lower than it was last year, but it's been very volatile as market conditions have changed. So a lot of segment complexities to track. It's been a very complex year to track from a market's point of view. Um, You know, and outside the volume sectors, you can see some of the differences. The gas sectors, like I said, have actually done really well. You know, we've got an idea of how global seaborne trade has gone, but actually gas has done better. And tracking our gas port call, port call activities at the top of this slide, you can see you know, we're actually in, we're not ahead of last year's trend now. And you know, we've found these port call statistics, which we've been doing daily, uh, daily calculations, we're using AIS movements data, you know, very helpful. But at the bottom of the graph, you can see the impact on things like ferries and crews. I mean, you, you know, on the cruise in the bottom right, you're, you're, you're really talking about a very low level of activity, um, and you know, in, in some periods, almost nothing uh, compared to uh, the actual sort of at usual annual trend of cruise port callings and cruise vessel activity and passengers. It's gradually getting back more to normal, uh, as one might imagine, as lockdown restrictions have changed. But in the spring, passenger activity was running, you know, uh, less than half of 2019 levels. So that some of these other sectors have seen a lot of stress indeed. Um, the markets now, I think, I think I would characterize it by a hierarchy. I mean, the gas and the containers are doing okay. In fact, the container ship charter rates uh, are uh, at decade highs. They're, 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 in some sectors, they're the, the highest they've been, the earnings of container ships since the global financial crisis. And uh, LNG's improving and uh, LPG's been fairly steady. Uh, but for instance, the bulk of markets are a bit more mixed. They're kind of okay, weak first half, lots of disruption, a better second half. The tanker markets are very tough indeed. Having seen these uh, record-breaking all-time high spikes in the first half, the tanker markets, uh, the VLCC, Suez Max, the product tankers, they are you know, big demand destruction. 
uh, oil demand is going to be seven or eight percent down this year, uh, and uh, also huge uh, uh, unwinding of the storage now. And as that storage unwinds, there's a surplus of ships. So those two things combined, the tanker markets look they're in like, like they're in for a tough winter and probably into next year. And at the bottom, the offshore oil and gas uh, also under severe pressure. The oil price and energy prices effectively crashed with the COVID crisis, and so we're now into another significant downturn for the offshore oil and gas sector. Although investment in wind, where the UK is particularly well positioned, uh, investment in wind, uh, offshore wind requirements um, have been accelerating. And that's, that's, a, that's another trend as well, which has been very interesting. It's only a small part of the offshore activity at the moment, but it's growing very, very quickly. And you know that, that has been a, a bright spot for uh, offshore energy activity. Um, so yeah, just running through um, these kind of uh, market slides. There's your tanker spike um, at the top left, but you can see how strongly that's eased back. The bulk has had a weaker first half, lots of disruption, particularly out of Brazil, uh, but getting better in the second half. Container ships, um, nasty dip down, and then uh, recovery to the best levels we've had for 10 years as volumes have improved. I mean, believe me, it's been a, an absolute roller coaster for the container ships. In September, shipments from Asia to the US were up by 30% year on year. Um, the gas carriers had a little bit of a sort of COVID wobble, the LPG carriers, but have, are now sort of back to OK levels, slightly above historical averages. Uh, LNG improving quickly. Car carriers have uh, struggled, um, just starting to improve a little bit. And down in the bottom right, you can see the severe stress. You know, offshore had spent three or four years in the doldrums. It was just starting to pick up. And now it's heading back to the bottom of the market cycle again with the oil price crash uh, at the back end of the first quarter this year. So um, again, lots of lots of different trends, lots of segment complexity. Uh, but overall, I think the theme is, you know, segment complexity, regional complexity, lots of short term variation within the year. But also, um, you know, overall, probably could have been could have been worse and mo a lot of the volume sectors are in a position where you'd say well that other than the tankers are in a position where you say well at least that's okay um on the supply side fleet growth is slowing i mean this is one of the helpful things um it's very manageable where the fleet is growing by somewhere in the region of two to three percent of the fleet that's not the sort of nine percent of the fleet we saw after the financial crisis and the order books at a record low the global order book for you know for ships is in terms of tonnage is seven percent of the fleet. You know at one point, as you can see on the graph, that was about fifty percent uh, after the financial crisis, and it's been as high as sort of fifteen to twenty percent in fairly recent years. But it's gradually trended down. There hasn't been much contracting of ships this year. We're going to have a very low year for contracting of new ships, and in almost every sector you can see that uh, with the exception on that graph of the LNG carriers, the order book percentage of the fleet is just a sort of key metric for assessing the magnitude of future fleet growth is, is, is relatively limited. So supply growth is manageable and that's very different from the previous crisis. Um, which brings us on to our next slide. I mean, before I conclude on the markets and move on to the post-COVID piece, I, you know, I, I think uh, there's a lot on this slide. I'm not going to go through it all, but you know, we we do believe there are a number of sort of key differences um, in this scenario that we're going through now compared to the previous crisis. Uh, you know, after Lehman Brothers. I mean, most notably, the order book is very different. We only have an order book today. At the start of the year, 10% of the fleet. Now, as I've just told you, 7% of the fleet. Um, 350 active shipyards or just a bit more at the start of the year compared to an order book at 52% of the fleet at the time of Lehman Brothers, 900 active shipyards, completely different supply side uh, environment and much more manageable once we get beyond the crisis. And I think I'd also pick out from that um, finance. The financial uh, situation is completely different. Going into the global financial crisis, we had an undercapitalized, perhaps under-regulated banking system, ship finance dominated by European lenders. Now we have a much better capitalized, more closely regulated system, but a lot of traditional ship finance lenders have exited. So I'll come back to that. 
despite you know entrance from Chinese leasing, green finance, etc. And then I think the environment at the bottom of that slide it is the other one, which I'm just going to talk about in a second or two more. So I'll, I'll skip it for now. But um, the theme here is that a lot of our clients are coming back to us now. So, well, OK, I can see what's happened to the markets. I, I, I can't predict. No one has a perfect crystal ball. We can't predict exactly how the rest of the COVID crisis is going to play out, but I've, I've, I've got, I've got, I've got sort of comfortable with the idea that I've got to manage my way through that crisis the best I can. We've got lots of tools for monitoring it, and we can, we're just going to have to sort of see how it goes. Um, but already, some of the bigger companies in the industry, I feel, are focusing very heavily on post-COVID planning now, and really that evolves around two or three things. First of all, the energy transition, environment, and regulation. And whether that's, I've written lots of things on this slide, alternative fuels, energy saving technology, speed, trade patterns, renewables, the energy mix and its impact on seaborne trade. These are all things that are right back at the top of the agenda. I think I'd also pick out technology, although I don't intend to talk about it so much today because it's not, it's not something you can easily do the data points on the way we can on the environmental and the regulatory. But uh, I think technology is back in focus. Uh, and I think understanding future trade patterns, this big debate between sort of globalization, continued globalization, increased regionalization, and the sort of impact of, of geopolitics there, and how that might impact on the seaborne demand for vessels, I think is, is also something that's sort of notably back on the agenda. But the one I want to focus on most of all is, is the green transition, which I think is, is, is critically important. Um, we try to conceptualize it into three parts. Um, uh, a fueling transition, which is the shift of the shipping industry away from uh, traditional fuel oil based uh, you know engines and fuel oil based usage basically to uh, new more carbon efficient modes of transport uh, energy saving technologies etc and we should have a look at that i think there's also importantly the energy transition where the, the 40% of seaborne trade is is energy it's fossil fuels, it's coal, it's oil, it's gas. Uh, looking at the changes there and how that's going to be important and how that is going to have to be managed. Um, and also then the offshore transition, which is the transition of offshore, which today supplies 17% of the world's energy through oil and gas and how that's transitioning to the offshore renewable segment uh, and how that's, you know, the offshore renewable segment is growing at 23% per annum at the moment. And uh, it's mainly in Europe, but it's gathering pace more globally. And, um, you know, this, so this, I think there's three separate transitions going on now. I, I'm mainly going to talk about the first one, but I think, you know, the, the, the energy transition itself is important, particularly from the point of view of oil, coal and gas and, and how their shares may develop. And I, I, th I think, you know, we've built, everybody's doing this right we're building energy transition models and we've done the same and we've built two models one for a sort of gradual transition one for uh, a more rapid decarbonization the difference with our model in clarkson's research is that we've sort of brought out the seaborne we've tried to pronounce the seaborne is it is it offshore wind is it offshore gas is it offshore oil uh, rather you know to to make this applicable to the maritime universe and, you know, I, th I think I draw two conclusions. One is definitely, particularly in coal, but also in oil and even in gas, there is going to be an energy mix transition for the industry to follow. And like I said, 40 percent of seaborne trade is in these commodities. However, the seaborne story can sometimes be a di bit different. There are complexities. You know, offshore growth in offshore gas might outrun growth in gas in total. Seaborne trade, depending on the origin and the destination of the cargoes, seaborne trade might have more legs in it than the actual energy production in certain commodities so there are nuances and i think that's going to be an important thing to continue to track but um you know of course this is going to create various pressures as we move through the next two or three decades onto the sort of seaborne cargo mix but then we get really into the nitty-gritty i think of the of, of, of perhaps more the fueling transition and and the big word decarbonization i mean i, I think i think first of all we would acknowledge that you know, we have to acknowledge, as I've said many times before, you know, the environmental and regulatory environment to our industry has been accelerating. And, and personally, you know, this has never been about lots of individual regulations. They're all important in their own right, but it's an accelerating wave of regulation, environmental regulation for the industry to try and meet the future requirements of the planet, if you like. And I, I think COVID has amplified this. The reason I'm talking about it is I think COVID has, has definitely amplified this and there is an expectation that 
decarbonisation and environmental trends will be built into, will be an integrated part of the, of, of the post-COVID recovery, if you like. Um, and of course, this has in, incredible implications for ships and equipment. Whether we started off with scrubbers, but whether it's ships with LNG capability, whether it's LPG capable ships, whether it's ships with ballast water treatment systems, uh, NOx equipment, high voltage shore connection, this is going to be really important to track. Um, this isn't not all of these items are specifically about uh, lower carbon. They're, they're sort of sulfur, uh, NOx, ballast water, they're all in there too. But this range of issues is going to be incredibly important. And we're doing everything we can do to sort of track the adoption of uh, technology. But there's two big uncertainties. The big first big uncertainty is with the regulations themselves, which aren't all fully clarified or clear, despite the best efforts of, of, of uh, you know, many groups, including the IMO um, and the MEPC. Um, but secondly, there's uncertainty about technology, which is the right technology to go for. And I think that, you know, that brings us neatly on to de the carbon decarbonisation challenge. Um, you know, the CO2 emissions goals. We know, we, you know, we're all aware of what they are in the middle of that slide, the 40% reduction in intensity by 2030, the 50% reduction in absolute total emissions by 2050. Um, I mean, I would point out shipping by our calculations and very similar to the IMO's number is only 2.3% of the global total of, of carbon dioxide emissions. And by our calculations, it's three times uh, less intense on a sort of per ton mile basis than rail or 9% less carbon intensity than uh, road transportation of cargo. And indeed, the graph on the left, the carbon emissions from shipping are about 20% down on uh, on the 20, 2008 baseline. But there's still a long way to go. Even though those numbers may have positives, uh, there's still a long way to go. A lot of that decarbonisation that's been done so far has been done by dropping speeds, 15 to 20% down across many of the sectors, and actually by the introduction of eco ships over the last, let's say, five years into the fleet that have been more uh, fuel efficient in general. So they're typically 20 to 30% more efficient than their predecessors. That has really helped. But of course, now we've got what, what do we do next is the challenge for the industry. And, you know, there are it, it's not as complex in, in terms of actual understanding the levers you can use. There aren't that many levers. Um, the, the issue itself is highly complex, but either we can move less trade, which uh, there may be some change to tra trade patterns. But as a whole, I think the shipping industry perhaps would rather not move less, move less cargo. Uh, cha further changes in speed, which I personally believe will continue. Fuel efficiency gains, and that's where your energy saving technologies on ships come into play. And probably last, but definitely perhaps the most important, uh, the fleet composition, the fuel types, the alternative fuels uh, being used on ships going forward from now. And that, that whatever model you do, my conclusion has always been, however much you tweak the other assumptions on speed, trade, efficiency gains, uh, energy saving technologies, you definitely need to have a major change in the composition of the fleet to get to the targets. And this is why people are looking at alternative fuels. And we're tracking as many as we can in terms of the uptake of alternative fuels across the world fleet. And of course, the, the uptake has been limited so far. The uptake of alternative fuels uh, is more prominent on the order book than it is in today's fleet. Um, I would say, without going into the details, you know, there's a lot to choose from. Uh, they all have major pros and cons. Uh, whether you're looking at LNG, LPG, methanol, hydrogen, biofuels, battery, uh, ammonia is one that uh, also comes into the reckoning. You know, I, all of these have pros and cons. All of them have great deals of complexity. All of them have issues around the greenhouse gas emissions through the whole supply chain. Um, it's no one knows what the what the low, longer term solution yet is really going to be. Track it may be different for different shipping sectors, of course. And tracking it as we move forward is going to is becoming incredibly important. I, I would say, for what it's worth, LNG is the one that's obviously gained traction because that's the one you can actually go and do. You can go and in many of the volume sectors, you can go and order an LNG fuel chip. Uh, but of course, that only gets you some of the way, and, and many of us see that as a bridging fuel to a only as a sort of bridging fuel really to a, a longer term solution. But obviously, there's a huge amount of track and tracking how the developments go. A lot of these that are at an embryonic level. Tracking this is going to become an incredibly important part of what we do, as is tracking the emissions themselves. And we've been sort of surveying the public listed companies 
as, as just as a matter of interest, really, to see who's reporting on what. And the amount of reporting has increased. Uh, but out of 240 public listed shipping companies we surveyed, uh, the number providing at least one of our sort of key environmental indicator, indicators was actually only 88. So out of those 88, 76 were, were reporting their total carbon emissions, um, 37 reporting their sulfur emissions, much smaller numbers, 32 reporting an EEOI, which is effectively the sort of carbon intensity of their work in terms of per cargo ton mile. So, you, you know, I, this is something that's going to be monitored very closely because we're all interested in seeing this information. Much more reporting has come into force. The EU MRV came into the force at the start of 18 the IMO DCS at the start of 19. There's a lot more data. Everybody's going to be following this very closely. For what it's worth, we've come up with some carbon benchmarks. These are provisional at the moment, but um, trying to understand what the carbon footprint per, footprint per day of ships of different types and the carbon put, footprint per ton mile of cargo they move um, I'm not going to go into the figures in detail. I mean, just as a sort of headline, right at the top there, you've got a VLCC tanker doing 170 tons of carbon per day. Um, you've got a Cape size doing more like 100 uh, tons of carbon per day. But let's let's not focus so much on the figures. What's important here is we believe that figures like these are going to be just as important in the future as knowing what the dollar per day's earning, dollars per day earnings of a ship are. Today, we all know what a ship is earning going forward charterers, owners, everybody in the industry is going to have to have an idea of not only what the ship's kind of commercial earning power is, but also what the carbon footprint that goes with that is. And, the, you know, we can have a lot of fun with this information, but also it's, it's se de deadly serious in terms of this will become, these will become key commercial metrics, just like the earnings power of ships and the value of ships and the prices of ships have become the same too. It's all going to need a lot of investment. I mean, we run a lot of scenarios. Uh, we know the order book's very low. We know alternative fuels adoption hasn't progressed as much as it could do in the last year because people haven't been ordering ships. But we also have an idea in varying demand growth scenarios of how much investment might be needed. And if, you, if we run our scenarios out to 2030 on replacing the older ships, uh, the, the ships we think will get replaced in the next 10 years and growing demand by 2% per annum, which probably is just below the historical average of the last decade, it becomes effectively a, uh, a trillion dollar problem. It's a hundred billion dollars a year. You might say that we won't get that demand. We'll get 1% per annum. You'll get, you get 80 billion a year for the next decade. So this is a huge problem. That's a huge investment. I mean, even in the biggest investment boom in history of shipping, in 2005 to 2010, we were doing 160 billion a year. So we're talking about doing two thirds of that uh, all-time record for 10 years in a row to meet the requirements of the fleet renewal and the re sort of transition of fleet technology into the future. That's a, that's a big number uh, and it's a scary number. And of course, there are many nuances to it, but a huge investment is going to be needed to get this forward. And the same for infrastructure too. You know, in, we're tracking all the infrastructure. We're tracking 5,700 ports around the world by function, by location, by region, but we're also tracking them by their environmental facilities. We think about 122 of those ports only at the moment offer an LNG bunkering facility with another 80 or so under development. We think uh, over 100 of those ports have got onshore power, um, high voltage shore connection, cold ironing uh, facilities. We're tracking all of that, but a huge amount of investment is going to have to go in on the infrastructure side too. Uh, we're tracking this every month in our, in, in our port and infrastructure intelligence report that we, we produce every month. And that's why the, I'll just come back to this at the end. That's why the financial landscape is important because the financial landscape has completely changed. The European ship finance banks, which were there, um, if we'd have done this list 10 years ago, you'd have seen Royal Bank of Scotland, you'd have seen HSH Norbank, you know, two, two of the biggest ship finances in the world at that time have both completely exited the business. Uh, uh, we've seen lots more regulation, more conservative terms. We have seen new finance come from export credit agencies, Chinese leasing. Uh, we've seen the capital markets relatively closed. Um, and we've seen an increased environmental focus with the Poseidon principles, which we talked about in this very forum last year. But the overall message is that the financial landscape has changed significantly. And actually, 
in general, I think we'd have to say is more constrained. It's okay if you're a top tier borrower, but below that, it's a lot harder. So the financial challenge for the shipping industry and also for the uh, infrastructure is, is very, very important indeed. So I, I think I, hopefully I've given you a good idea of our view on uh, the impacts of COVID. Hopefully I've given you um, a good view of what, what we might think some of the important issues beyond COVID, particularly related to the energy transition. Um, I've left some key sort of takeaways on this slide, but I don't think there's anything there I haven't mentioned. This is really more for the reference of, of, the, of the audience when we circulate these materials afterwards. You know, and I would just say that uh, of all the data points I presented, or almost without exception, the data points that you've seen in this presentation are all available on things like the Clarkson research, shipping intelligence network, and uh, the environmental stuff largely on our World Fleet Register. So there's, you know, we've created um, platforms where this is this data is available to, to you know, our clients and, and interesting parties. So uh, at that point, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I think um, I've, uh, I've, I've come to the end of my presentation, but absolutely very happy to take any questions that people might have. Well, that's um, the, the usual tour de force. I mean, there's just uh, just so rich information. Um, you, you're, um, uh, we're all going to be uh, poring over your slides for a, a long time to come, I think. It's a great, great takeaway. So um, questions, perhaps while people are lining up, I know uh, Hans put one in the, uh, uh, in the chat function there, but so uh, people do, do get ready to ask questions as well. So Han, perhaps? Well, um, yeah, just a quick one, um, uh, Trevor, you, it, it was quite uh, interesting to see the significant difference in recovery during the second half of the year between the Pacific and the Atlantic. So do you think uh, that this will lead to maybe a split both in terms of how the freight rates will, uh, will behave within the next six to eight months and also difficulties in positioning the, the tonnage in, in loading areas? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I, I, I would say of, of, to, two answers to that question, or maybe even three, but obviously, yes, is that when one area is recovering faster than another, it pronounces imbalances that you might have. And particularly in the bulk carrier sector where, you know, the market can be quite sensitive to the sort of Atlantic Pacific balance. Um, yes, I think so. Um, I think obviously we're, we're fingers crossed the Atlantic's going to get there too. And it is improving. The Atlantic is improving quickly, but it's not quite as improved as much as the Pacific region. But also it is part of an underlying trend as well, isn't it? And I think we've talked for many years about trade and ownership of uh, assets in the industry becoming more Pacific focused. So it perhaps also represents that. And thirdly, it also represents the fact that, you know, China is shipping's biggest market. China's about 22% of global imports in tons terms. It, it, it's, you know, we always say this, China's shipping's biggest market and its biggest customer. And um, China got back to work very effectively in, in April, and that enabled the, the sort of Pacific economies to be moving ahead of the Atlantic. I, I think, I, th I think I think it's the theme that's with us for a little while, uh, but probably uh, you know it, it's also un, you know it is representative of a longer underlying trend. But obviously, uh, you know I, I think we would expect the Atlantic to continue its recovery too. But um, I mean it, it, it is it is quite interesting when you see how quickly uh, if you if you really drill down to the, some of the statistics we have, you will see that. Uh, you see in my graph there of the Chinese port calls. The Chinese port port calls got back to the 2019 trend by May. So, you know, it has, it has done, you know, the Pacific economies as a whole perform much, much more strongly from a shipping point of view. Um, so th th those are the kind of three answers I would, I would give to that question, Han. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, could, oh, could, could I just... Go okay. Uh, this is for Trevor, really, because uh, they're very interesting uh, uh, presentation there, Trevor. <laughs> Thank um, you. What I was, it, what uh, was, what um, I think came out of that for us, we we're into solar uh, zero carbon shipping um, and trying to um, create a system that would be workable if we were going that route, a hundred percent, which of course I know is is not going to happen, <laughs> not, not before twenty fifty anyway. Uh, but COVID um, is a bit of a wake up call because um, it's shown what can happen um, when there are problems with international trade. Uh, and I was thinking, um, 
uh, I'd love to get hold of your data sets and, and, and do a study on what would be possible with uh, a high degree of automation on, on the ports, as I think I mentioned earlier. Um, sure. Yeah, um, so that, that's very interesting because, and also uh, a means of uh, COVID, well, pandemic proofing ports uh, with a high degree of automation, perhaps. And um, some kind of uh, filtration system. Uh, the goods that come in, if it was mostly autom automated, for example, if you had a high degree of unloading of ships and docking, um, and, and as you probably know, we're all going, very, very, there's various projects at the moment for autonomous shipping. Uh, and it won't be long, I don't think, before you've got autonomous docking as well. If, um, how, however, that won't work its way into the system for, for, for many years to come. Um, so I'd be very interested in looking at your, your data sets. And, and the question would be, is it possible to um, pandemic proof uh, ports with a high degree of automation? I mean, I, 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 I'm not sure I'm the best qualified person in the forum to answer that question even, actually. But um, I mean, my, my take on it would be that, well, well, first of all, I would say, you know, there are degrees of automation, aren't there? And some degrees of automation may have helped here. Um, I mean, I didn't really focus much on the kind of operational disruption. I guess my job with my presentation was to talk about the markets as a guy who's working in the sort of commercial end of the, the markets piece. Um, but obviously, there's been huge operational disruption um, and of various types, whether that's to do with crew or actually uh, port disruption and closures and what we're seeing in the US at the moment, where we're seeing lots of logistical disruption, getting the containers back to the US West Coast to get to Asia in the container shipping sector is leading to all time high container freight rates because there aren't enough containers back in back in China. Um, so, I mean, operational disruption, yes, automation, automation, I think, is something people are looking at as part of that technology piece. Are we able to COVID proof or shock proof a system? I, I doubt that's ever 100% true, is it? I guess what I would say is shipping has been, and I was saying this to Tom before we started, shipping has always had a, look how resilient shipping has actually been. I mean, look, no, nobody likes a negative three seaborne trade figure for 2020, right? That's, that's bad news for shipping. We'd rather not have that. But actually, uh, perhaps, it could have been worse and perhaps shipping has proved incredibly resilient because of the nature of the shipping market so you know i i don't know whether you're able to completely shock proof stuff but um i think what the, the important thing for shipping is i spend most of my time there talking about post-covid planning and uh, the environment and the green transition the second thing on my post-covid slide that i think no lots of people are talking to us about is technology I, I can't do the data points on technology as well as I can on the environment, so it doesn't make for such interesting slides. But uh, absolutely looking at technology solutions to uh, learn from what's happened in the COVID crisis is emerging our people's agenda. I, I, I know, you know, the, answer, the reason I can't give you a straight answer to the question is because I have no idea. Um, but I think what we do have in the shipping industry now, when you're talking about data sets, is thanks to things like AIS and, you know, we've spent the last two years in Clarkson's research building, building a what we think is a world class database of port birth terminal infrastructure. The, the combination of those two things does allow us to get into the detail of, you know, what actually happened. Let's have a look at some of these port calls. Let's have a look at the duration. Let's have a look at how long the vessel spent before it was able to enter the berth. Let's have, have a look at how uh, how the average duration of port calls for a certain ship type was impacted by, you know, the operational disruption of COVID. Those things are, you know, there's a lot more potential in that area than there ever, there ever has been. Um, on your solar, I I don't know. I guess um, I, I think I talked about this about a year ago, and not so much today. But you know, add it to the list of alternative fuels, right? And I, I guess the point I was making was that if you you have to embrace, you probably have to embrace LNG for the next decade, and you have to embrace all these carbon-free alternatives beyond that pretty quickly, or, or you won't get to that 2050 target. I guess so. Um, absolutely, we're we're as interested to hear. Obviously, you're embedded in that area, uh, but we're absolutely interested to hear. We, we, we see it as our sort of mission to to track uh, uh, as many as possible, if not all of these alternative fueling options and see how they get on. Yeah, okay. But, but uh, definitely feel free to contact me about data and I can put you in touch with the sort of guys in our organization who might be able to tell you what we have and you know under what terms it could be available. I think it, it sounds as though it's it's worth, worth doing uh, some kind of a study on, on this uh, to, to be able to know uh, what kind of direction people should be going. You were talking about shipbuilding uh, 
uh, be, being cut back uh, considerably. I'm not surprised, are you? I mean, nobody knows. What's oh, no, I, I think I think absolutely. I mean, one of the things we've said about shipping, I mean, there's so much I could have said this year and uh, I couldn't fit it all in. But, um, you know, day to day shipping definitely definitely has proved very resilient. So, you know, our day to day tanker fixing desk where most of the tankers are fixed on a spot voyage, single voyage basis, pick up a cargo, ballast to the next one. You know, those guys, super busy, lots of turnover. Um, and that hasn't really been disrupted. People who are hiring out container ships for three to six months time charter. That hasn't been true much. You know, there was a period of disruption, but then the industry has proved quite resilient. But more stra strategic transactional decision making, like, am I going to suddenly invest, you know, uh, 500 million in a new build program or am I going to sell a whole fleet or buy a new one? Um, I think a lot of those those kind of parts of that, that 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 does get more affected by uncertainty. And you can't blame anybody for not trying to finalize that decision right now. They've got the uncertainty of the COVID crisis, and that's also amplified the existing underlying uncertainty over technology choice, particularly around fueling. So I, I think there are signs that's coming back, and the second half's been better than the first. But but absolutely, I don't think anyone should be surprised. Day-to-day -day shipping has proved quite resilient, and there's been a lot of improvement in the second half. Big strategic transactional decisions have often been delayed or pushed back. Okay. Um, and one last oh, sorry, thing. Sorry, Nelson, I better, um, we better crack on, I'm afraid, uh, just for the, the, the time frame there. Um, yeah, we can, I think we could all question Trevor for all, all day. Um, but, uh, uh, Trevor, thank you ever so much for that. Um, no problem. Thank you very much, everybody. Brilliant. Thank you. Right. Uh, now, final speaker, bring in uh, Richard, Richard Kreiner from BDO. Um, Talk us through the BDO shipping confidence survey. Now I am going to do the uh, the screen share on this, so bear with me, callers. And... Right. How are we doing, Richard? Sorry, can you? Uh... Good morning, Tom. Yeah. Hey, good, good, good. Now I don't think. Sorry, I'm just going to try that again. So I think you've still, you haven't got the... Uh... It wasn't running. I could see it, but you needed to run the slide deck. Sorry, folks. Okay, are we there, Richard? Yeah, yeah. If you can, can you run it as a slideshow as well? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Sorry about that, folks. Yep. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, very warm welcome from me. I'm, I'm sorry that we can't use your, offer the usual BDO hospitality this year, but we've grown accustomed to that during the course of this year. Hopefully next year we will be able to revert to that more normal way. As Tom just said, I'm going to present on the shipping confidence survey we carry out and give you a current perspective. And my apologies that originally I planned to be the scene setter for today, but uh, circumstances intervened, which means I have to present the wrap, so to speak. Next slide, please, Tom. Okay. There is no doubt that we are in a period of volatility. It's something I've used in the past and the last nine, 12 months have proved that once again in space. Next slide. The question then is how to calibrate this volatile environment and gauge what people's view are in the wider context and what they're thinking. And fortunately, uh, now some 12 years ago, we launched a survey of confidence in the shipping industry. And we've been measuring that confidence now on a quarterly basis ever since. Uh, and I'm very pleased today to give you a sneak peek of the latest survey that we carried out this month. 
Um, Tom, could you just, there's, I think, um, five chevrons to come. Absolutely, yep. that's fine. And over the next few slides, I'm going to cover those various different aspects of the confidence survey. Next slide. So firstly, who the respondents are. Next slide, please, Tom. The type of respondents we have are dominated by ship owners, managers, brokers, as you can see there. Uh, next slide. And in terms of location, we have a very strong uh, contribution from Europe, but also an important contribution from Asia. The, the balance between the two has actually changed over time and the European element has become a little bit more dominant in the whole. Um, but equally, I'll say a few things about the uh, variability in the respondents um, by region in a sec. Um, next slide. So the first thing we measured is a future, uh, sorry, is a current measure of confidence. We asked respondents to tell us on a scale of uh, one low to 10 high, how confident they were in the shipping markets in which they operate. Next slide. And there we are. This is across the whole timeline of the confidence survey. And on the right hand side, you can see the latest outcome. Uh, in the November quarter, the confidence in industry came out at 6.0, which is an uptick on the level uh, previously in August at 5.6. It's slightly down from where we were a year ago, where it was at 6.4. But you'll notice also it's recovered from its low point in this recent cycle, which was in May at 5.1. And that 5.1 wasn't quite the lowest the confidence level has ever been. That point was hit in February 16, as you can see by looking across there. So I think overall that probably uh, in confidence terms looks like a V. Uh, next slide. The next question we asked was is a future measure about, um, we asked respondents again on that uh, one low to 10 high, how likely it was their business would make a major investment or significant develop in the next development in the next 12 months. And as you can see, again, on the right hand side, in the current measure, the likelihood of that on average came up from 4.8 to 5.3. It is slightly down from where it was a year ago at 5.5, but it's also recovered from a low point throughout the life of the survey, which was hit in May at 4.0. So again, it seems like there's a, a V-shaped recovery in the expectation of making an investment going forward. But we have to sort of set that in context uh, as Trevor uh, rightly outlined in his presentation we have to remember in terms of uh, investment in steel, anyway, in ships, that the last three to four years have been extremely low. And as Trevor summarized, in total, there are only 7% of the world fleet on order in all the shipyards of the world. So that, that things are very constrained in that area. Next slide, Tom. The next area we looked at was um, influencing factors which is again, a future measure. We asked respondents to tell us about the factors that would most affect their business over the next 12 months. Next slide, please. The outcome here is on a weighted average basis. And you can see that um, demand trends led the way. Um, and it's significantly ahead of the next weighted average factor, which is competition at 21% followed by finance costs. And that ranking over the last few years anyway has been consistent. I would say the, um, the impact or, or the um, profile of demand trends has heightened. Uh, and then if you go down the influencing factors, you have some influence from regulation and operating costs, but you'll note that tonnage supply has, has dropped down to sixth place at nearly 8%. So is relatively speaking of much less concern. And fuel costs, which were, I think, a year ago, around about the 8 9% level, have dropped right down to 1%. I think uh, the implementation of low sulfur fuel oil is now, in industry terms, behind us. Next slide, please. The next area that we looked at um, 
partly through uh, the Confidence Survey tool and then also partly through other data that BDO holds was in relation to costs. Uh, the first question we asked was about finance costs. And the question was in 12 months time, do you expect finance costs to be higher, lower or the same as they are now? Next slide, please, Tom. And if you, I've used a couple of these slides, which those of you who've seen this presentation will be familiar with the layout. The, the thing to look at particularly is the right hand column, which is the current survey results. Um, so we, we asked the question, as I said, about whether the expectation was of finance costs being higher, the same lower, and that produces a net score. As you can see, there is a net sentiment of plus 18, so an expectation overall that finance costs will rise, but that expectation has eased um, compared to the previous quarter where it stood at plus 30. But I think one also needs to take a step back in the bigger picture and to remember that in all the time since the global financial crisis, the interest rate environment has been very low and that is very supportive towards the shipping industry and to others. Next slide, please. And one more click, Tom. Thank you. Um, the next area that we present is around ship operating costs, where uh, BDO uh, perform an annual benchmarking exercise across the world's fleets. Um, the most recent actual results of that um, for 2019 are presented there, and there's a continuing trend of gradual decline in ship operating costs in real dollar terms over time. Um, the expectation for the year we're in and next year is of increases, but not massive increases, certainly, and certainly by less than the rate of inflation. So I think overall, that message is one of a very much a controlled cost environment. Next slide, please, Tom. So the next area we looked at is in relation to the freight markets. And of course, in what we carry out, we can only really do a very much a helicopter view. So uh, it's normally the case that I speak first and then Trevor or one of his colleagues will say something about the markets. This time it's the other way around. So the question again that we asked was a future measure. Um, that we asked them about the likely movements in the freight rates over the next 12 months. Do you expect them to be high, low or the same? And indeed for the tanker market, firstly, it's quite interesting on the right hand side, on a forward measure, the sentiment has improved. What we can see comparing maybe to a year ago is the rapid erosion of the confidence in that space. And indeed looking at how the tanker market evolved during 2020, as Trevor covered already, the expectation of a lot lower rates coming visible in um, the May quarter and easing, but continuing on a downward expectation in August. But looking forward now, the sentiment has turned into a positive direction, which I think one hopes is a sign of better things to come, but we have been in a very volatile tanker environment already this year. Next slide, Tom. The next uh, market segment that we looked at was in the dry bulk segment. As you can see there, there's a continuing strong positive sentiment, uh, increasing um, compared to the last quarter. So I think overall something to, uh, hopefully be positive about there in the dry belt sector. And then the next slide, Tom. In the container ship space, um, a continuing positive sentiment there. But what we didn't see was a, an anticipation of the significant uptick in charter rates in some segments of that market. So there was never that really, really strong. But the, the overall expectation is still positive. So next slide, please. So in terms of all of those things, maybe just to pull some conclusions together, I think there are a lot of reasons to be confident. Uh, Tom, do you want to put up the next um, 
five chevrons, I think. That's it. That one back. Thank you. Sorry, I apologize. I, I forgot I'd left some animation in there, but at least I'd had a look at it up front. Um, so confidence levels. Um, I think whilst we're not at the peak, what is noteworthy is that V-shaped recovery um, and the recovery and confidence from the early 2020 lows. Um, on major investments, it is undoubtedly a good time to invest. Um, there is uh, financial liquidity available, but it is you've got to go and look for it to, to find it and to put together a project. Costs are controlled. Um, the interest rate environment remains very benign overall. Operating costs are clearly under control. And, you know, a year ago and more, we were talking about... Um, low sulfur fuel oil introduction, et cetera, at the beginning of 2020. Really all that now has been negotiated and really is behind us, which is great credit to the industry. And freight market expectations, um, there's currently a positive sentiment in all three segments. So if you bring all that together, you know, is there anything that should temper that confident conclusion? Next slide, please, Tom. This was my rather poor attempt to illustrate graphically or in an image uncertainty. There's, there was already a lot of it around and clearly the last 12 months have increased the level of uncertainty dramatically. Next slide. This is my illustration about the environment and I'd echo what Trevor was saying earlier. Um, this is a constant, frankly. Um, and the whole issue of decarbonisation has to be grasped by the industry. Next slide. But it's not only the environment and the, the environment piece of environmental, social and governance. It's the social and governance aspects too that also need to be brought to the fore. There are a lot of challenges on the agenda. Again, as I'd echo Trevor's words there. Um, and it's all businesses therefore need to rethink how they carry out their business to be prepared for this decade and the next several decades to come in order to adapt their business and to thrive in the future. Next slide. And that concludes my brief presentation and I'd be very pleased to take any questions. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much indeed, Richard. Um, any questions from the floor? I could start one my, myself, Richard, just while people get their Please. thoughts ready. But Please. It, it, in terms of the factors influencing business performance now. The, mm -hmm. I, I thought the cruise supply was surprisingly down the list. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, with all the issues with crew this year and, and COVID. As, um... Yeah, it, it, it hasn't been ranked as a high, high item. Um, I think ultimately at a very high level that there are sufficient seafarers to um, put on board the ships of the world. What you have seen, and I didn't sort of show the detail about the cost side, the operating cost side, is there's definitely an increase in uh, ship operating costs caused by the massive disruptions to uh, crew change fundamentally. One hopes that that will not remain an ongoing issue, but it's definitely been a feature of the year 2020. Yeah, perhaps it wasn't uh, an, an issue because they, they couldn't get off the ships. So, <laughs> being slightly cynical. Uh, for anyone else, any any questions for, for Richard? We're all remaining, remaining doggedly quiet at the moment. Pam, I 
bring in Han. I, I think we're probably at the, the time frame for the, uh, uh, for the session as well. Um, uh, Han, I'm bringing you back in. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think um, I'd like to really thank everyone um, for their participation and contribution this morning's webinars. Uh, it's been an interesting and thought-provoking morning for all of us. Um, Mark has given us some encouraging signs, I think, in terms of readiness of the ports um, ahead of um, the, the next year's Brexit um, preparations. But um, I presume there are some question marks remaining in terms of the other stakeholders in the transport logistics um, serving the ports environment. And that remains to be seen how we're going to end up in the new year. Um, travel as usual, has given us a very comprehensive view of um, what the current circumstances and the future might look like. Um, I think green transition will play a, a very significant role in his view uh, in post-COVID markets um, and uh, fuel, energy and offshore. The changes in these areas probably are going to be accelerated by, by COVID uh, and uh, we'll see what that brings in the in the new year. And Richard has, um, I think, overall presented a positive sentiment looking ahead into the future uh, in a cost-controlled environment with some positivity, perhaps, in terms of the, the, the possibility of investments continuing into the new year. So um, I think it's been an interesting, interesting morning. And of course, we look forward to the new year where we can hopefully have a more sort of normal environment and opportunity to engage with each other in person um, in the events that we're going to hopefully um, put together in the in the new year. Uh, so back to Tom. No, brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Han. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. Thank you for you, the attendees. Um, I've put a note in the chat uh, saying the presentations and recording will be sent round after this. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for your time. Um, hopefully the insight and information you've gained today uh, sets you up wonderfully for 2021. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. Cheerio. <laughs>